Hello everyone, um, this is going to be a short introduction to um, generalize additive models or GAMs. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to go into too many details, so consider this more like a taster of uh, what uh, fitting data using GAMs entails. And hopefully this will just give you a general idea of what you can do um, with GAMs and then perhaps that will sort of inspire you to go into uh, more details. Right, so uh, I'm sorry, this is actually the outline for the two-hour uh, version of this, uh, of this presentation. Uh, so in fact, we'll uh, only be looking at part one, introduction to GAMs, uh, up until uh, comparing groups and between groups with interaction, um, which we're not going to see. So we're going to uh, see a general introduction to what GAMs are and then the basics of GAMs, which will allow you already to fit uh, basic models. So you will learn uh, all of the, the things that you need actually to get started with GAMs. The two-hour presentation, the two-hour workshop also includes, of course, interactions, random effects, and the second part would be a hands-on, uh, but of course we're not going to uh, have um, that today. Um, so generalized additive uh, models, or GAMs for short, are basically a generalization, that's why they're called generalized, and sorry for the typo uh, there, in generalized. Uh, it's a nice uh, like a pronunciation spelling there. Um, so um, they are a generalization of uh, linear models or generalized linear models. And basically the simplest way to represent this uh, mathematically is to have y equals um, some function of x. And this some function is actually a smooth function. And you can think of smooth as just a curve that fits the data, a curve that is not necessarily a straight line, which wouldn't which would make it not a curve in the first place so um the uh the main difference between linear models and gams is that linear models have only parametric terms uh, so this is a like like simple example of a potential linear model f0 is a function of vowel type uh, and voicing and duration and parametric terms fit linear effects, so they're just fitting a line. On the other hand, GAMs add non-parametric smooth terms. They're also called simply smooths or also smoothers. You will find uh, all of these in the literature. And to, to go back to the example with F0, now we have F0 as a function of vowel plus voicing plus some function of duration in this case. Smooth terms fit nonlinear effects, right? So you see that in the GAM example here, you have a mix of parametric terms and smooth terms. The parametric terms fit linear effects as you know them from, um, for example, ELMA, and the smooth terms fit nonlinear effects. And this is like a minimal um, uh, example code in R. Um, GAMs can be fitted in R using the MGCV package. I never quite remember what the acronym stands for. Uh, sorry for that. But um, the main function that you would be using when fitting GAMs is actually the GAM function. That's easy to remember. And the syntax is literally the same as the um, one for Elmer with the addition of the S terms, the smooth terms. And in this case, uh, the model just states Y is some function of X. And in this case, X um, is uh, expected to be uh, possibly a nonlinear effect. So that's why we're using a smooth term. So uh, to, to give you a, like a, um, um, an example uh, of what kind of analysis you can do with GAMs, we're going to be using in this tutorial, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation, we're going to be using data uh, on pupil size. This is pupilometry data from English, young and older adults. 
uh, from McLaughlin in, at all. Um, and uh, you see there the link to uh, the paper. And this was a word recognition task. The participants heard a verbal stimulus and they had to repeat the stimulus. Um, and uh, words were either, uh, sorry, words were coming either from a sparse neighborhood um, or from a dense neighborhood. Uh, so you have uh, half of the words are uh, from a sparse neighborhood and the other half from a dense neighborhood. And the hypotheses that were put forward in this paper are that recognizing words with more competitors, so words in the dense neighborhood uh, condition, should come at a greater cognitive uh, cost, meaning greater pupil size, relative to recognizing words with fewer competitors, the sparse neighborhood condition. Uh, this it was expected to uh, um, occur across the board in young and older adults. Uh, then more specifically, the cognitive demands associated with increased neighborhood density, meaning greater pupil size, should be greater for older adults compared with young adults. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start setting up actually a model that um, sort of wishes to um, test this hypothesis, but, but sorry, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, since we only have an hour here, um, I will not be able to show you the full model, uh, but I can refer you back to the full materials of this presentation if you want to see what the final model would look like. Um, the original study used uh, growth curve analysis, or GCA. Um, this is a more contrived way, actually, of uh, analyzing nonlinear effects. So, of course, in this case, we are going to apply GAMS instead. A caveat, we're analyzing the whole time course in the um, uh, registration of pupil size rather than just a subset. Uh, as done in the original study. So, uh, of course, the results um, will not necessarily match those presented in the paper, not only because we're using a different methodology, but also because we're looking at the entire time course of the data. Right, so this is just uh, a, um, this is to show um, how the data was read uh, into R. Um, I'm just um, conversing the condition column that you can see here into a factor so that we have sparse as the first level and dense in the second level and age as well over here as a factor with levels young adult and old adult and then I wanted to standardize uh, the um, the pupil size in fact the the units that you see here in pupil um, under uh, sorry dot bind are uh, uh, arbitrary units used by the instrument um, used for recording pupil size. Uh, and since the numbers were quite large, I just wanted to have smaller numbers. That's why I said school them, but this doesn't really uh, matter much. And uh, this is just a uh, GG uh, plot of the data. You have uh, to the left the young adults, YA, and to the right the old adults, uh, OA. Then the first row is the sparse uh, words data, and the uh, second row is the dense word data. So you can immediately see that there's much more uh, variation in the young adults than in the older adults um, in terms of um, variation of pupil size. And sorry, I should have mentioned this. Um, each individual tra trajectory that you see here, it's from one participant. So uh, let's start very simple and we're gonna build up um, this uh, this model, of course, uh, this is just for pedagogical reasons. Remember that when you're actually uh, approaching a data uh, data set and you want to use GAM, GAMs, you're not supposed or I mean, it, it doesn't uh, make sense to start small and then adding things. I would just start with the maximal model that you need to answer your particular research questions. Uh, but for the sake of this uh, presentation, we're going to start with a uh, with a very basic model. Um, in this case, um, the function that I'm using is BAM rather than GAM. 
Uh, BAM simply stands for uh, big GAM and it's used for uh, data that is large. What large exactly means, we don't know, in the sense that there isn't a definition of large data sets. Um, and it doesn't actually hurt to use BAM even with data sets that are not that large. So um, in this presentation, I will always be using the BAM function. And in fact, for your data analysis as well, you, uh, you can simply use BAM in all cases. And the idea is that uh, when there's a lot of data, using BAM speeds computation up a little. Um, and then, of course, we have a simple model with pupil um, z-scores as the outcome variable as a function of a smooth over time beans. So, of course, uh, if I show you here, we have on the x-axis uh, the time beans from which the pupil size were collected by the instrument and zero represents the onset of the verbal stimulus, basically. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's quite a lot of data in terms of time course. Uh, we go up to um, three seconds, basically. And um, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to model a curve that uh, discards completely the fact that there is a sparse condition and, an, and a uh, dense condition, the fact that there are young adults and older adults, but just wants to try and fit a curve uh, to the data uh, along the time beans, over time beans. And then, of course, you have to specify the data. And again, S just means smooth. So basically, this model is saying, uh, give me a uh, fitted curve um, along time beans for pupil Z. And this is the summary of the model. Um, the uh, first few bits should be familiar to you. If you used Elmer, this is just a Gaussian family and the link function is identity. Oops, that doesn't really, um, that doesn't matter. And then the formula is repeated. And then we have uh, two main uh, parts of the summary that are the important bits that you should be looking uh, at. One is the so-called parametric coefficients and one is the approximate significance of smooth terms. So remember that I mentioned that uh, LMs only have parametric terms or coefficients while, um, um, while GAMs also add smooth terms. And what you see here is in fact that GAMs have both parametric coefficients and smooth terms. And in the parametric coefficients part, now we're only seeing an intercept because we haven't included any, um, any um, parametric terms in the model, but intercept of course is always there. And what this, um, what this in estimate and standard error are telling you is the mean uh, height of the curve in the data. Since I have standardized pupil size, of course, this is going to be very, very close to zero. Uh, and then you have standard error with relative p-value, sorry, t-value and p-value. Uh, I'll tell you more about how to interpret these later when we add uh, parametric effects in the model. The approximate significance of smooth, of smooth terms basically tells you whether um, the EDFs are significantly different from one. And the EDFs are related to how wiggly or uh, curvy the estimated curve is. The higher the number of uh, estimated degrees of freedom uh, EDF, the higher the number of EDF, the more wiggly the curve is. When EDFs are one, that's just a straight line. So the p-value here just tells you this is significantly different from one, meaning this is not a straight line, it's just a curve. And then you have uh, other information about um, um, uh, variation explained and uh, parameters of the model that I'm not going to discuss today. Uh, so basically, based on this estimate, we know that the uh, average height of the curve fitted over time beams is basically uh, zero. The average height is zero. And that indeed, um, the effect, let's say, the, the, the trajectory of pupil size over time beams is definitely not 
a straight line because the EDFs are greater than one and they're also significantly greater than one. And now we can actually obtain the, sorry, obtain the prediction uh, from this model that we can later plot. And what this uh, function predict gum does is that uh, it extracts the predictions from the model and returns a tibble with um, the uh, columns of the outcome variable and the uh, terms in the model. In this case, we only have time bins. Um, and the uh, standard error uh, around the predicted value for pupil size and then also the uh, lower and upper boundaries of the confidence intervals are calculated here based on the standard error over there. Uh, so this is like nothing special, it's just the predicted curve um, or the predicted trajectory of pupil size over time bins, bins sorry, and this is um, the um, these are the values predicted by the model. Uh, this is going to make much more sense in the next slide where I'm actually plotting the predictions. So you can see that you can use the predict gum uh, function to obtain the predictions, sorry, to obtain the predictions and um, then you can just plot it um, using the plot function and you will have to specify the series argument to tell the plot I want time beans on the uh, x-axis. Um, this might seem a bit redundant here because there's only time bins, but when you have multiple smoothers in a um, in a model, you will like that. It makes even more sense to have to specify the series. Uh, so basically, just by using this function and then plotting it and speci specifying the series, you obtain the predicted trajectory based. On the model right so what you see here are simply it's simply the plotting of the values here it's just the same thing um, you might be a little bit unhappy with this because it doesn't look very curvy it looks more like a series of uh, segments and this is just because by default the plot function selects um, only uh, if I remember correctly only 15 points uh, or 10. So you can actually specify uh, a greater um, number of points along the predicted curve uh, so that you can get a smoother curve. And the argument, sorry, my mouse keeps, <laughs> really sorry for that, my mouse keeps uh, scrolling back. Um, so um, the length uh, out um, argument of predict gam will actually return now a hundred rows instead of actually sorry I can tell you here instead of um, eleven points right um, so instead of just getting eleven points that get plotted here you will get a uh, hundred points and if you look and you count all these points they're actually a hundred. So now you have a smoother uh, representation of the predicted curve. And overall, what this is basically saying is that from the time of uh, stimulus onset, when uh, participants hear the word, then there's an increase in pupil size uh, that reaches maximum um, uh, size at about, uh, let's say, 1500 milliseconds to then slowly decrease uh, and probably go back to baseline um, later on. So just by this simple GAM, we have like an overall understanding of what the uh, general trends are in the data. And if you think about it, it's quite amazing because if we look back at the data, like they look a, a bit all over the place. Uh, but when you actually use modeling, you see that there is indeed something that is expected, which is that pupil size increases uh, after uh, hearing the stimulus um, as expected because you have a greater demand, a greater cognitive demand. So this is quite nice. Right, so uh, the wiggliness of the resulting spline or how smooth the spine is, is partially constrained by the number of the knots. Uh, I'll tell you a bit what, sorry, I'll tell you what the knots are in a second. The more knots, the more wiggly the spline can be. Or also the more knots, the less smooth the spline can be. 
You can set the number of knots, uh, which is the argument k of the s function, of the smoother function, uh, using the argument k there. Remember that k cannot be larger than the number of sampling points in the variable to smooth over. So if you only have 10 time bins, you cannot select 11 knots because it can only be as, um, uh, as many as the um, sampling points. Um, and in this case, I just selected three, which is the minimum, in fact, I should say. So k cannot be larger than the number of sampling points, but cannot be smaller than three. You need at least three knots to produce a curve, basically. That's just maths. Doesn't really matter. Uh, and when we actually look at, uh, when we actually plot the predictions of this model, uh, where I specified k equals three, then you look that the curve is very, very much smoothed out. You just basically have almost a parabolic-like uh, curve where you go up and then you go down. And this is very, very different from what we have seen here. Um, and But if we do increase k to 20, uh, then what we get is a much smoother... Uh, sorry, it's a less smooth curve. The data is not uh, smoothed over and the um, let's say the idiosyncrasies of the curve are maintained. So by changing the number of uh, knots you can actually obtain a smoother or a um, more wiggly curve. And um, the number of k is actually um, doesn't have to be uh, selected necessarily. You can in most cases you can use the default and the default tends to be something like 10 knots, um, but it depends on the data. Uh, and what happens is that you specify the maximum number of knots that the model believes are necessary, and then the model will estimate the actual number of knots needed for that particular smoothness of that particular, uh, or wiggliness of that particular data. Uh, in other words, there are procedures that penalize very, very smooth, um, sorry, very, very wiggly curves, um, based on the data. So that is estimated automatically uh, by the model and you generally don't have to talk about. Uh, there are also ways to check if the number of knots is actually appropriate, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to talk about those. Uh, but what you need to remember about k is that the higher the number of k, meaning knots, the um, the wigglier or the overfitted the curve will be to the data. Right, so uh, moving on, comparing groups. Uh, so far we, we've seen like a very simple model that just had basically a smoother over time bins. Uh, but of course we have uh, groups here. In fact, we have four. Uh, we have two conditions and two participants groups. So comparing levels uh, from a uh, variable can be achieved with the bivariable method, which is by specifying the variable as the value of the by argument in the smooth function. So before being able to just include uh, this variable as the argument, uh, sorry, as the value of the by argument in the smooth, you first have to change the factor to a uh, ordered factor you need to change the factor contrasts to treatment contrasts. The default is in ordered factors is actually polynomial contrast and this wouldn't work um, as, as expected. And then you uh, include the factor, uh, you also have to include the factor as a parametric term in the model. We'll see what this means in a second. Um, not only as the bivariable. And then you will have to include a reference smooth without the bivariable and a different smooth with the bivariable. Uh, this is quite uh, abstract, but this is um, the first part of what they just said. You first need to convert condition um, to a ordered factor with the S ordered. So you get uh, the ordered version of condition and the same for age. And then you need to change the contrasts to uh, treatment for both condition and age in this case. So you have contrast treatment 
for both. This is an important uh, step. Sometimes uh, I myself forget to do this. And what happens is that the output of the parametric effects will look quite uh, unfamiliar because polynomial um, terms are used instead of uh, contrast treatment. Now, let's just start with age. Uh, let's um, um, let's just um, focus on age for the time being. And this is what uh, the model would look like if you want to model the difference between uh, younger adults and older adults. So you have to include age, uh, the ordered factor age as a parametric term, which basically just means add it in the model as is, as you would in a linear model. And then you need a reference smooth uh, this is the reference smooth. You see it's just S over time bins. Uh, I selected 20 as the K here. Um, and this reference smooth, basically, uh, you can think of it as the reference level of age, which is uh, young adults. So this basically will model the um, trajectory of pupil size over time bins for the young adults. And then you have the uh, different smooth, uh, and you have to uh, write it this way. It's uh, S over time bins by age O, right? And K again is equal 20. And this smooth will basically model the difference between the effect uh, or the trajectory in the young adults and the trajectory in the older adults. And if you think about it, this is exactly what happens when you run a linear model when you, uh, and you include a term that has two levels. Uh, the intercept is going to be the reference and uh, then you're going to get an estimate uh, for the difference between the uh, intercept and the other level. But let's look at the summary to see what happens. This is our nice formula over here. Now in the parametric coefficients, we have again the intercept. And remember, that's the overall height of the uh, reference curve. So the overall position on the y-axis of the curve. And again, it should be very close to zero. And then we have also the uh, difference in overall height in the curve for the older adults relative to the uh, younger adults and you see that there's a bit of a difference overall the uh, pupil size of uh, old adults is lower than that of young adults because this is how we have set the model here and the p-value also tells you that this difference is significant. Uh, now, if we look at these smooth terms, now we have the reference smooth without the by variable and then one with the by, by variable. Again, the EDFs here tell you um, if the reference smooth, the pupil trajectory of young adults is not aligned. If EDFs is greater than one, then it means that the trajectory is not a straight line, but it's a curve. And here we also know that it's significantly different from one. So this is definitely not a line, a straight line, but no surprising because we know that it's not a line. We've seen it also in the raw data. Then finally, what this smooth is telling you is whether the uh, trajectory of pupil uh, size for the young uh, adults, which is the reference smooth over here, is different from that of uh, older adults. And again, if this is uh, greater than one, then there, it means that there is a difference between the two groups. If the EDFs are precisely one uh, or close to one or non-significantly different from one, then it means that there isn't a difference. In this case, the EDFs are greater than one and they are also significantly uh, greater than one. So just by looking at the uh, at the summary here, we know that the overall uh, pupil size in Z schools for the young adults is basically uh, almost uh, zero, which is not surprising. And that overall, on average, the um, sorry, the pupil size uh, for um, older adults is a bit lower than that of the young adults. And then we also know that the pupil trajectory is not a straight line. And we also know that the trajectory for uh, older adults 
does not have the same shape than that of the young adults. And I'm saying shape because remember, the height is uh, taken care of by the parametric coefficients. So in fact, and sorry if this is a bit abstract and I don't have plots to show you, but in fact, you could have exactly the same shape uh, of the curve, but one is slightly higher than the other. So you would get um, significant parametric coefficients, but then the different smooth would not be significant, meaning that the curve is exactly the same shape, but it's higher in one case than in the other. So you see that the interpretation of the summary is a little bit different than what you would expect for uh, linear models, for example. Right, but why not looking at the uh, at the output, right? Uh, why not just plotting things? And here I'm just using again the predict underscore gam function with the model pdq underscore gam underscore three. Uh, now I'm specifying already that I want 10 points over time bins um, for prediction. Uh, 100 and then um, you and then we plot again now we specify again the series is time bins and now we can use another argument it's the comparison argument that basically just colors the different trajectories in this case by age uh, and you can see now that the younger adults are the purple line over here while the older adults the yellow trajectory uh, you can see that on average, the younger younger adults have a higher pupil size, meaning they their pupil size increases. Um, um, uh, sorry, it's on average higher, and while it's on average lower for the um, uh, for the older adults. And then we also know that the shape is not the same uh, in the younger adults and older adults, uh, and we know that because this smooth was uh, sorry this smooth was significant and it makes perfect sense because look the two curves start exactly uh, basically they are identical here and it makes sense why would like just waiting for a stimulus be different in younger and older adults um, and then what happens is that in fact it's after hearing in this case sorry the stimulus that there is a difference uh, so even if you adjust for difference in average height, then the shape is going to be different because this shape is much shorter than that shape, if you think about it, right? So you see that um, when looking at the summary, you do get some information uh, overall about the differences, but then it's really just a matter of plotting and looking at the plot to like know exactly what is going on. And I want to stress this because um, in most cases when I um, when I start introducing GANs, people are so uh, sort of worried um, that they don't understand how to get a p-value that tells them, yes, you know, uh, the, the, the curve is different in this particular way. And in fact, uh, I mean, I myself moved from uh, null hypothesis significance testing and p-values to Bayesian um, uh, modeling. So I'm not a particular great fan of p-values in the first place, but I think in particular with GAMS, uh, it's important to sort of move away from p-values as much as you can and uh, focus on the uh, predicted um, curves or trajectories of the model and then qualitatively assess them uh, rather than just rely exclusively on p-values. And I think this is very nice because it adds quite a lot of um, interesting um, possibilities that you wouldn't get just by looking at a p-value. So just with this, again, it's another simple model. We are just modeling differences in age. Uh, we see that there are differences uh, overall in age when not accounting for the sparse versus dense uh, versus dense um, um, uh, neighborhood, sorry. Now, this is great, but what if we want to have a slightly more quantitative way of looking at the difference between these two curves uh, in a way that it's still visual uh, and that it sort of tells us where uh, these two curves are different? That's where we can actually get the difference between the two curves with the get difference function. 
uh, you need to specify the model, again, the series, and again, the uh, number of points you want to obtain for plotting. And then you can use the compare argument with a list where you specify the variable you want to compare the levels of and the two levels that you want to compare. Again, here it might look a bit uh, redundant because we only have age uh, O and it only has to um, levels, but when you have more predictors and more levels, then it makes sense that you have to specify which ones you want to do. And the function just returns a tipple with, again, HO time bins. Um, the difference uh, for each point along time bins between the older adults and the young adults curves with standard error and lower and upper credible intervals but let's just look at the plot because it's much easier to understand what happens so basically this this curve tells you um, um, the difference between the two curves here and um, the red part sort of tells you uh, along which time bins the curve is actually, the two curves are actually different or significantly different from each other. Of course, when the uh, difference is zero, then uh, we have a no significant significant difference because it's zero but as soon as we move away from zero then you get a, a significant um, difference and what this plot is telling us is that uh, just sometime after zero to uh, sometime uh, after 2000 milliseconds the two curves are significantly different from each other while they're not uh, before that time and after that time uh, and that basically means that the curves are different from somewhere around here to somewhere around there and da thank you very much we can see it from the plot uh, but you'll see, well, you'll not see, sorry, because we're not going to cover random effects, but when you run, when you add random effects, the credible intervals um, generally um, increase by quite a large margin, but that doesn't mean that the two curves are not actually significantly different from each other. But in this simple case, you know, we could have just look, looked at this and say, okay, they will be significantly different from each other, right? Um, and also, of course, the more different they are, the more apart they are from each other, the greater the curve, uh, the difference um, curve will be. So you see here that the maximum difference actually happens around uh, at around 1500 milliseconds, which also happens to be more or less um, the maximum pupil size. So very interesting. And you see all of this is really qualitative, like I've just produced a plot. Uh, that tells us along this, uh, along these values of time bins, there is a significant difference. But then the rest is really qualitative, and I strongly, strongly encourage you to think about it in these terms. It is a quantitative approach, right? It's generalized additive models, but then most of the things that you can get from it are sort of qualitative by looking at the plots. And I know that a lot of researchers feel sort of like imposter syndrome because they're just looking at a, a, at a pretty plot and they feel that they need more. But remember that statistics is not only about uh, p-values and perhaps some of you know about Bayesian statistics and some of you might actually um, uh, go to the presentation on Bayesian statistics. So don't worry, really. Um, it's important to... Um, to uh, embrace this different way of doing things and I promise you it will save you a lot of time and a lot of stress but because when you try to get p-values for everything using GAMS uh, you just basically uh, lose it completely so um, yeah just a general warning that it's good to think of these things in terms in qualitative terms uh, more than quantitative terms. Right, so uh, in the longer version of the presentation, uh, I would have uh, talked about random effects here, but um, I'm going to skip that and instead I'm going to show you how to obtain something that looks like an interaction as we know them from uh, linear models. Since we want to uh, model the effect of age and the effect of uh, neighborhood density uh, on pupil size and of course their interaction. So technically, GAMS do not allow for interactions. Uh, they are generalized additive models and interactions require 
multiplication of terms, but with GAMS you can only um, um, sum terms uh, with each other. We can get interaction like comparisons by creating a uh, factor interaction and using them as by variables. So what this means is actually very uh, simple. You uh, create an interaction between um, age and condition using the interaction function and you convert that into a ordered factor. And then remember again, you need to uh, change the treatment contrasts, right? So uh, if you want to model age and uh, condition and the interaction between the two, in fact, what you need, to, where you need to start from is this. And I repeat this in a second, but um, by um, but when you want to include multiple terms and you think that there might be an interaction and you want to check, they need to be included in the model with this method, right? Uh, there's absolutely no way of having a, uh, a smooth with a by age variable, a smooth with a by cond variable, and then an interaction smooth. Unfortunately, that doesn't work with GAMS. You need to start from uh, an interaction, um, uh, factor interaction like this. And this will model the effect of age, the effect of condition, and the interaction between the two. And as you can see here, this looks exactly like the model that we have seen before, but now we are using the factor interaction rather than age and condition separately. You have age and condition as a parametric term, sorry for the typo, uh, and then you have a reference smooth without the bivariable, and then the difference smooth with the bivariable age and condition. Uh, this is the uh, one way of doing random effects. As I said, I'm not going to discuss them, but uh, let's just um, you know let, let's just not look at them for uh, for now. So you see, this is exactly like the model before, but now we have a factor uh, interaction between age and condition. And again, there is no separate age and condition terms, nor parametric, ni neither parametric nor smooths uh, with bivariables, right? So basically, when you want to um, fit a GAM model to data, think uh, about uh, which terms, which variables you want to include and whether they could potentially have interactions. And in this case, in fact, we do need to look at interactions because that is the whole point of the second hypothesis, looking at differences between older and younger adults in terms of the sparse and dense neighborhood. So we really need need this. Uh, again, what, what this means is that, in fact, I should have started with this model, right? If this was a uh, real research um, scenario, I would have started with this model, not with the two models that we have seen before, with just age or with no age at all. Um, and this is what the summary looks like. You have parametric coefficients that look exactly as they would in a um, in a linear model uh, if you included age condition interaction in the model. These again tell you whether there is a significant difference in overall height of the curve relative to the intercept. And in this case, the intercept uh, means basically young adults sparse, right? Because that are the two reference level for age and condition. And then again, we have the approximate significance of smooth terms. The interpretation is again the same. Uh, the reference smooth means the trajectory is not a straight line. And in this case, we know it is. We have EDFs greater than one and it's significantly different from uh, one um, because the p-value is below 0 0.05. And then you have the difference smooth, of course, for each combination uh, of age and condition relative to the reference. This is perfectly one, and you also see that the p-value is actually not significant, meaning that when you look at the shape of the curve um, in the um, younger adults sparse, and you compare that to the older adults and the sparse condition, the shape is exactly the same. There is no difference in shape between uh, 
younger adults and older adults in the sparse condition. But they differ in height because if you look at the parametric effect, this um, there's a bit of a difference. Sorry, now that I see the p-value actually it is not significant and the standard error is massive. Uh, so this also tells us that in fact, the two trajectory don't change in terms of height nor in terms of shape. But if we look at um, the um, younger young adults dense, in fact, the young adult uh, young adults dense uh, trajectory of pupil size is different in shape from young adults and sparse. And we know that because the EDFs, sorry, are greater than one, and they're also significantly greater than one. And then again, uh, we see here that there is, in fact, an uh, uh, overall increase in pupil size in the dense condition, which makes sense, right? Uh, we were stating that uh, the dense neighborhood condition should be more cognitively demanding, so we should see a greater, uh, in, uh, sorry, we should see a greater increase in pupil size, greater pupil size, because uh, it's a more demanding task to uh, process a word that it's in a dense neighborhood. So by looking at the, um, at the um, uh, summary, we can already say uh, that yes, it seems that for the young adults, the dense condition elicits a greater demand reflected by greater pupil size. Uh, when we look at the older adults, uh, there's a bit of a difference, which is very close to the one that we saw here, and again, it's not significant. So the older adult, uh, older adults' dense uh, trajectory is not significantly, so, sorry, the height of it is not significantly different from the height of the younger adults' uh, sparse. Right. And sorry, this uh, this will make much more sense when we look at the plot. I like doing this um, because like, I like to look at the summary first, um, because at least like you, you try and figure out how things work out before actually seeing the plot. But the best thing to do is actually uh, when you, you know, if you wish and when you have time to go back to the presentation and then after you have seen the plot, try and uh, interpret the summary again. And that's what I do actually in, uh, in, real, in real research scenarios. I uh, look at the plot first, actually, then I look at the summary at the plot and the summary and I go back and forth to make sure that I'm actually understanding the summary based on the plot. Uh, and the uh, old adult's dense uh, overall height is not significantly different from the uh, older adult, from the younger adult sparse. Um, and uh, again, the shape is also not significantly different from that of young adults uh, because the p-value for the smooth is not uh, significant. Uh, now you might wonder, you might ask, uh, how do I know the p-value for the combinations of the other um, uh, levels? Well, uh, this is the same issue that you get with Elme, that of course the levels are ordered in a particular way, um, and uh, for Elmers, you might have used the e means package before. I don't think it works actually. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work with GAMS. Uh, but again, do you really need p values for all of the combinations here? Um, would, you, would it be enough to actually uh, say that you fitted a GAM model uh, with these terms and then you finally show them the plot instead? And when I say them, sorry, I mean your readers, for example. Um, and this is the the plot of the um, of the uh, model results, you see that the confidence intervals are massive and this is because we have included uh, random effects, uh, which is the last, sorry, it's this term here, right? And as I mentioned before, when you include random effects, the confidence intervals tend to be very uh, large. And uh, this is how you get the results, but we want to do better, right? Like this is very busy. We actually want to separate uh, the results in different panels and so on. And we can easily achieve that uh, using the separate um, argument in the predict gum function. Uh, and in this case, we're basically telling the predict gum function to separate the uh, age underscore cond uh, term into age and condition by splitting the levels 
um, sorry, by splitting the levels um, using the dot. And you see here that here you have young adult dot sparse, old adult dot sparse, and so on. And what the separate function does is like now, please give me two columns, one called age and one called condition, uh, where you separate these uh, levels um, by the uh, dot there. Uh, and then we reorder the levels. So basically, if you just run this bit, what you get is a tibble with the predictions. And now you have, in fact, two columns for age and condition that you can use later on for plotting. Uh, now that we have separated this column, we have to refactor it and order the levels as we wish. Um, and actually, that shouldn't be there, but never mind that. And we save all of this into that variable and then we can actually plot it. Again, series time bins and comparison condition. And now we can facet uh, by age. So we have young adults and older adults. And this is nicer because now you see uh, the individual trajectories uh, for young adults and old adults for this dense and sparse, uh, sparse and dense condition. Now, Look at the young adults, there's much less variability, in fact, compared to the older adults. And at least in the dense condition, the pupil size is higher um, in the uh, young adults relative to the old uh, adults, and also a little bit higher in the sparse condition over here. So it seems, in fact, that the higher demand is on the young adults rather than the older adults because we have a greater pupil size in the young adults generally in these two curves than in the old adults. But it is true that a dense neighborhood elicits a greater cognitive demand and sorry I did it again, um, a greater cognitive demand and um, uh, in the dense uh, neighborhood, right? But look at the curves, at the predicted curves in the older adults. There's honestly possibly no difference. Look also at the predicted confidence intervals. They are basically identical. So there might be differences there. In fact, this curve could also be something like this, right? Because that's how the confidence interval work. But based on the data we have at hand, there isn't basically differences in pupil size elicitation between the sparse and the dense condition in the older adults. Um, while we do find it in the young adults, and if we do in fact get the difference, because you might say, of course, yeah, okay, but like, look, the confidence interval uh, intervals overlap quite a lot, yes, because we have included random effects. Uh, but if you actually just plot the difference between uh, young adult dense and young adult sparse, then you see, magically, I'm joking, that um, there is a significant difference uh, between these two curves um, exactly where we are expecting it to be, which is uh, after the onset of the um, of the stimulus and within the time window after which, sorry, within which the participants will have responded uh, back uh, to the stimulus. So if we go back to the curves, basically we go from zero here to 1500 there. Again, makes perfect sense. And isn't that wonderful? Like we managed just basically by looking at the plot and with some added knowledge from the summary, uh, we managed to say a lot about the data with a very, very simple model, right? Like we just had basically a factor interaction between age and, um, and uh, condition. And that was it, really. Uh, but we managed to say quite a lot. And uh, this basically um, tells you how flexible gums are. And this also comes with a downside that since they're so flexible, they can become very, very complex and it, it can become a little bit more difficult to interpret them. But again, I want to stress this again and again and again, just plot the results. Just look at the plots, look at the, the predicted curves. Uh, first thing after the model has finished fitting and you'll see that you will be able to um, to use the power of GAMS to your advantage.
Right, and uh, that's basically the end. As you uh, as you see, this was just a very brief introduction, but this really should uh, give you like the um, uh, uh, head start on how to use GAM. And I really wish, uh, I really wish this actually has worked for you um, when you have like one hour presentations on uh, quantitative or statistical methodology. What happens is that we spend a lot of time justifying why you should be using that particular method, explaining the concepts behind it, uh, and then you don't really go away from the presentation uh, knowing how to fit a model. And yes, these are very, very simple models. You might need to add more things to them and understand how to use random effects. But I hope that with this, you actually gained some basic understanding and now you can really go back to your data and start getting your hands uh, dirty. So uh, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference.